November of 2012, November the 5th in 2012, uh, I got married and we had a relative acquaintance do the photos for our wedding. And it was such a afterthought, I think, in the way that I went about finding a photographer. I obviously having never been married before, didn't quite realise the importance of it, but at the time, we were dealing with some uh, pretty severe personal dramas. So my mother-in-law was in remission from treatment for cancer. And whilst we were over the moon that she was in remission, uh, it obviously wasn't a time where we were particularly excited about how the last couple of years had gone. And at the same time... Um, for a variety of reasons, my family was in something of a civil war, um, meaning that it was very, very hard to be planning an event where you would be bringing all of these people together for one day without these issues rearing their heads. So we had been engaged for two years and the wedding planning had been nothing short, to be honest, of a nightmare. Uh, we were living about a county apart, which in England isn't much, but it's enough to make things a little bit difficult. And between my wife running a care home um, and myself going to college and also working, um, planning the wedding and then caring and dealing with family drama and so on, we spent very little time really discussing the wedding. I can remember maybe five or six sessions over two years where we actually had conversations. And of those five or six, at least three of them were just arguments between the two of us and someone else that didn't want us to do things the way that we were doing them. So anyway, it rolls on and we end up getting married 5th of November, which is an excellent day to get married if you are bad at remembering dates. And the photographs start to sort of leak out as they tend to do after a wedding day. And initially we were quite excited. We'd, we'd seen a couple that were uh, not bad, pretty good. Um, but when we got the wedding photos back, despite our complete lack of knowledge of anything, I think that the word I would use would probably be underwhelmed at best. Um, and as time's gone on over the years, we've become more and more frustrated and depressed about the lack of adequate photos from what was the only chance we'd ever have of getting these families together. Um, this was compounded by the fact that Jamila's mum sadly passed away a short while later, and obviously now recreating those photos would be impossible. It's actually also the truth that this was the only time that our families convened. Um, they hadn't met before the day other than in passing. There was no dinner. There was no nothing like that. There was no real uh, friendliness, I would say, between the two, purely because of uh, distance and each family having their own thing to focus on. And as a result of that, disappointment with our wedding photos and the surrounding dramas of the wedding I for some reason that when I say it out loud escapes me decided that the best course of action was for me to buy a camera with the money that we got from the wedding um, I didn't use all of the money from the wedding I'm not that kind of guy but um, I remember going out to Jessup's in Worthing and purchasing a Canon 550D which lasted about three months, I think, before I decided I had to go full frame because the internet told me I had to. And I purchased a 5D Mark II off of a product photographer secondhand, which was in essentially mint condition and things escalated from there. I've since made it my business model to essentially become the anti, I guess the antidote to what we went through with wedding photography in that I want to be someone that A, 
knows what I'm doing to the point that no matter how ridiculous the scenario, I can still come up with something to do uh, to help. I, I want to work 120% to help every couple get photos that they like. Um, maybe sometimes you don't always go through or things don't always go the way that you expect them to, but uh, my heart's always in the right place and I'm working hard every single day since I bought that first camera to be a better photographer. And that brings me on to the beginning of this podcast. So I'm actually sat here with my wife, who is my business partner. We've been together for 15 years, married for seven. Um, we've we've run a business together now for how many years? Oh, I think it's five, six. I think it's six years, I think. I, yeah, somewhere I think around then. I think because we're getting to that age where we think we're still young. Oh, yeah. Things are older than we expect. So let's say six years. And you've run the admin side of my business and in the last three years through a baptism of fire, you have become a photographer. Yes, I have. And you still don't consider yourself a photographer. No, actually, it's funny you say that because I think a couple of months back we were talking about something and I used the words we or us in the photography sense. And you said to me, that's the first time in three years that you've actually referred to yourself as a photographer. So maybe I'm starting to come around to the idea that I am actually a photographer and and not, because I think before it was always I was the assistant and um, I didn't always feel that my photos were very important. Like what I did was that important during the day, okay. which is a stupid thing to think. It was more my nerves about what I was doing and the fact that I had so little understanding of cameras and photography itself. So, so it's the case that you, was it like a self-protection that you thought if you underplayed your importance, it would underplay the pressure on you on the day? Yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much nailed it on the head, yeah. Because it's something that, because I've always been as you've referred to it as book smart more than life smart. Um, That's not uh, how I refer to it. <laughs> no, but, but more book smart, you say. You are, you're more academic than you are street smart. Yes, that's, that's definitely true. And when it comes to physical skills where people, maybe people go out and get a vocation in something, that's not really ever really been me. So um, to do something that would technically class as a vocation was to me something that was so huge to learn and I had to learn it in a way that was so different to my normal learning style. It was completely out of my normal realm. So it took me so much longer to understand, I suppose, the science behind photography, but also but, just to understand it. But would it not be the case, obviously knowing you, I might be wrong here, but knowing you, I feel like I might have an idea on this. Would it not be the case that you were almost brought up to not appreciate vocation? that it was more about academics than it was vocation. 100% correct. From from day one of reception, which is stupid because I was five, six. But yeah, no, my entire life really has been the academic side of things rather than vocational. So that definitely plays a part in it. Um, but yeah, now I would consider myself, now I class myself as a photographer and I refer to we instead of just me. you yeah. um and then i'm there to help you know so i yeah i've definitely i've come along i'm n by no means perfect i still have amples to learn and stuff like that but i've definitely come along and i'm feeling quite comfortable where i am now and that i can continue to learn and progress and get even better well you're also quite a quiet person generally although there'll be people that probably disagree with that because they've got to know you over the years but mm. the truth is you are a very quiet person when we are actually at home together you tend to sort of sit with yourself and I tend to sit with myself I'm working and you're doing whatever you're doing um, and we're not particularly loud people we're not we're not um you're definitely not a talker no I've always been more of a listener than a talker and or an observer I think is probably a better word yeah um and yeah you're the more talkative out of the two of us and it's only when outside of our relationship it's only people that I suppose really know me really really well yeah so that would be my family where I am definitely an extrovert and I just kind of say what I think and stuff like that so but yeah I'm definitely more introvert which I think with regards to photography and me photographing weddings um 
I suppose, would it be hindered my progress? Probably not hindering my progress, but I suppose slowed it down because I think to be a photographer, especially a wedding photographer, you have to have those social skills. And I, I'm not saying I lack in those social skills. I'm comfortable talking to people. But you're, not, you're not just not very I'm, forthcoming. No, I'm not. And I tend, I don't like to be the centre of attention. And But I think, I think that that's a misconception. It's It's not just you, it's... I think every second shooter I've worked with and for a long time myself was under the impression that being the wedding photographer, you were the center of attention Mm. and you're not, you're a blip on the day in most people's memory. Yeah. If you can just make the five seconds that people actually notice you not miserable for them, then chances are you get a recommendation. Um, And I think that's where people fall a little bit foul is they think that, they think that they are an integral factor in in the day when you're actually an integral factor in the memory of the day yeah there's yeah, been there's right. been days where i've had to and you've had to be more than a photographer you've had to i i mean you're you're fantastic for emotional support with with brides and other members of the family and um you also roll your sleeves up and help out with things. I mean, you're you're essentially every wedding you're a de facto bridesmaid that's actually useful. Yes. Because most bridesmaids are on the whole fairly useless. Um but we both roll our sleeves up and we help out where we can. But the the main point of us being there isn't for us to be the centre of attention. The main point of us being there is to photograph it, which is mm. really straightforward when you actually say it out loud. But I think a lot of people actually get there. Their wires crossed a bit in what a wedding photographer is. Yeah, definitely. So there was a, a turning point for yourself with photography um, from from an outsider's point of view. So about fourteen months ago, um, I had had my head turned by Sony a few times, and being a card carrying member of the Canon Shooters Club, um, there isn't a card. <laughs> um, but being being a Canon shooter, I was always a little bit off. I'm I'm not a big fan of change for the sake of change. I, I think I have to really have my hand forced. Um, and the last few years, there's been a, a real um, slackness to the way that Canon's gone about updating things and bringing things out. They're very much about two years in the hole behind other brands. I think Nikon's equally falling apart at the same time. And Sony seems to be the one that's the front runner in what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and now... Canon and Nikon are chasing that and it's not a particularly good time to be a a Canon shooter for the sake of uh, their lack of respect for people that are professional shooters that have a Canon badge on their camera. So about 14 months ago I'd had my head turned but the problem with Sony had always been the, the single card slots and the horrendous lack of lenses and one thing that never gets discussed um by other photographers I've noticed with Sony was that pre- uh, the A7 III level cameras, they hadn't had a joystick for changing your focus point. So changing your focus point was a real ball ache. Um, so they bring out the A7 III and the A7 R3 um, and they have joysticks, they have dual card slots. The battery isn't a cracker, so it can actually work for more than 10 seconds. Um, we don't change batteries now over the course of a day, so the battery life on Sony is pretty good. The, um, the my head was sufficiently turned that I actually thought I would dual system myself, and I would get the A seven R three to act as my portraiture camera, and the five D Mark IV would continue to be my sort of run and gun um, mass assault weapon, as it were. <laughs> as soon as I got the A seven R three, you took it. Yes. And your photography has gone crazy since. Like, I think you've gone through so many barriers and so many walls in 14 months. It's unreal. Mm. So what is it about the Sony that has helped you sort of, how have you implemented that as a tool to make yourself a better photographer? Uh, Comfortability. Just the physical use of that camera um, is incredibly comfortable. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, petite person um but I'm also not a huge person but carrying around weights like the uh Canon and then trading lenses and stuff like that um actually became quite a chore and and made it 
at some points, especially when you're doing candies and I was walking around, I was like, I have this great big heavy weight. So the the Sony is completely different. It's it's very neat. It's very compact. It's all together. And even though I can use the Canon lenses on it, even when I put like the 85 on, I even with an adapter, I don't feel like I've suddenly got this huge extension of myself. I feel like it's part of me. So I think it helps my 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 shyness and me being a bit of an introvert that I can now like ninja around people and it, the camera is me. So I feel much more comfortable like that. Um, I think that's probably the mo- one of the most important things. And then other than that, simple things like the fact that I can actually see the photo as I'm taking it rather than taking the picture and then waiting to see what it looks like. Um, and I love the fact that it has like, this is an exaggeration, but like a billion focus points and I can go pretty much anywhere. Well, so. To be honest, it's not far off that compared <laughs> to what you were using before and what I'm using. Generally, it's not far off that at all. Yeah. Um, the other thing I noticed with the uh, the Sony and, and the way that you worked um, was the face detect. Oh God, yeah. The face detect, uh, especially with, uh, it's a very particular problem, but with wedding ceremonies with a huge window. So just so uh, to sort of put this into context for people that are listening, uh, when we do wedding ceremonies, I will be at the front behind the registrar or the vicar or whoever uh, photographing the couple and I'll photograph the bride coming up the aisle. Jamila remains at the bottom of the aisle on the opposite side to me. And she starts off by photographing the groom's face, seeing the bride, and then you do all of the the back of church or back of ceremony stuff, and I do all of the front of ceremony stuff. And if you have a particularly big window, um, what would be directly in front of the couple, that's a nightmare for you for Mm. focusing, especially with your previous camera, which was the uh, 7D Mark II, which I would say is probably your least favourite camera ever. Yes, my least favourite camera. So it's my bad for thinking that that was adequate for you. But it, it served its purpose. It did what it, it needed to do. Didn't. It actually <laughs> didn't. It was a pretty poor camera overall. Um, and the the face detector sort of really picked up on, on that issue. And now I don't, we don't have a session of moaning after the ceremony with what did and didn't work this is true yeah unless you get like a family walk in as the rings are being exchanged and stand in the middle of the aisle deciding where they want to sit <laughs> they're half an hour later to the but, start that, of but at that point you and i are telepathically like Just, cursing at each other yeah. like how why <laughs> well if i think if we see that if you see that i'm being blocked from doing something you kind of step up a little bit and try and do a bit more over that course so when the rings are mm. being handed over and it's being done in the way that there's no chance i'd be able to see it you absolutely make sure that you're getting as many different shots as you can yeah and in the situation where families decide to start turning up half an hour after they were supposed to and then stand in the aisle making it look cluttered and blocking your view <laughs> i'd have to adapt the way that i shoot a little bit yeah so the camera's made a big change mm-hmm. um is it also just the sheer volume of weddings that we've done has helped with your confidence with it? Yeah, I think having, especially that that crazy year where we shot nonstop um, and I think we didn't really stop working other than when we were physically out of the country. Yeah. Um, otherwise we worked all the time. So this was 2017. Yeah. And we photographed 70 weddings. Yeah. Including having January off and... Uh, I think a fair bit of February as well. We didn't really get started until the March and then we had 70 weddings, which might not sound particularly crazy. It might sound absolutely nuts to some people, but it might not sound particularly crazy. But when you realise you're taking eight weeks out and then you've got 70 weddings to do, that's it, it was nuts. It's a lot of weddings, yeah. And it wasn't just the uh, the number, it was the location of a lot of them. We had some crazy combinations in there. Yeah, and for me, I was obviously tying that in with my day-to-day job as well. So it was... I actually kind of like it. It was that whole throw you in at the deep end. You've got the basics, you've got the foundation, but let's throw you in in the deep end. And you you kind of, it's basically that flight or fight mode, essentially. Yeah. Um, And I, 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 how many flight times were there? How many times do you think I just want to run away from this? I would would admit there was definitely a few. (laughs) I can't remember a hundred percent all of them, but yeah, there was definitely a few where I was like, nope. Nope, not doing this. I do the Cartman walk <laughs> out of the venue. Um, but no, uh, I, I think it's one of those things. I think that sometimes you need to put yourself in a position where you're not comfortable, you're not familiar. You need to kind of throw yourself in at the deep end and give it your all because that is the point where you will know whether you can or you can't do it. 
you can't just kind of pitter well, patter around. Well, not to be the book smart one, but obviously I was listening to uh, Jordan Peterson talk about that it's like biologically um, beneficial for you to throw yourself in at new challenges and things that are difficult and struggles because you actually develop from those struggles. You become braver, you become um more adaptable and, and the skills become more ingrained in you and, and your adaptability actually helps you throughout life generally speaking and i absolutely agree i think as much as as you like to talk about that year about yourself i think this is where we can be a couple a little bit definitely um <laughs> 70 weddings as a primary wedding photographer who'd only for a guy who'd only shot about 40 before that in total is nuts. Well, we do have to bear in mind here that not only were you the primary, but you were also doing all the editing. You see, I do nothing after the wedding day other than send a link and post the USB off. We need to clear that up, that you do a lot of the, you do all the heavy work after a wedding. So you not only photographed as no, a I don't do all the heavy work because you do the admin. The stuff I wouldn't yeah, touch I, with a 10-foot barge pole, and if I did, I'd lose a lot of clients. <laughs> but if we talk about, I mean, yeah, but my, my, a lot of my stuff is pre-wedding where yours is heavy on the post. So, you know, you take into account that not only did you photograph 70 weddings off the back of, like you said, 40 previously, mm. you're also going back. So you're actually reliving those days. So you're actually doing, say, 140 days worth Yeah, of, and of not one of those weddings was outside of my self-imposed deadline. I didn't, I didn't sort of, sort of have a meltdown and let stuff just catch up and, yeah. and go a bit crazy yeah. and try and have to finish like 10 weddings at once. I was always I th- on top of it. Yeah. And I think that in that year, I think you, you definitely developed, um, and progressed so much. I mean, as I've always said, you have a shortcut for everything as in like on your uh, keyboard, yeah. you'll hit a button, you've, you've manufactured the shortcut to help you get to a certain point rather than do everything the long way to improve how you um, complete your tasks and uh, the efficiency. That's the word I'm looking for. Sorry. Um, And you've become a very efficient editor of weddings as well. And I think that that bump, because you had so many to do that kind of helped bump you forward. And even this year you have developed more efficient ways of editing photos and getting them done so but I think that that year kind of basically was like the kickstarter for it yeah I think as well what I did learn in 2017 with all the weddings that we were doing is that you could do an awful lot of editing in camera um in the way that you shoot so yes you can try and get things as right as possible in camera I think with weddings people people who talk about weddings theoretically um not to be too crass here, but they can fuck off uh, because I, I do spend a lot of my time being told by people who don't shoot weddings how it should be done, Yeah, uh, which is an extremely frustrating thing when you've had to go through some of the combinations of issues. If you take your worst day at work and then add in two emotionally charged families, uh, a couple who are spending thousands of pounds and not getting what they thought they were getting from you know, a venue or from a videographer or even from myself, if they thought um, I was a different photographer from what I am, either through their lack of research or a complete miscommunication on our part, mm-hmm. um, it becomes a very bad day at work for anybody. So I, I've worked previous jobs and none of them were as emotionally charged as this. And then when you take into account, like you say, um, trying to find ways to be more efficient with the work and trying to find ways to kind of... Um, I always think that I think it was the Bill Gates quote about like you never hire the hardest working person, you hire the like the laziest because you'll find the shortest route to the solution. Yeah, it's actually a, to be honest with you, that's actually a really good business model to work on. Yeah, because it it makes perfect sense. Yeah, and and it's to the point now where I think depending, it's really funny because weddings are a really serious business, but at the same time they're not. It's like some of the things that you kick off about, and I don't mean you, I mean myself. Some of the things, okay, so some of the things that I kick off about that are just so funny when you take it out of context, like how angry I get about how much a venue spends on light bulbs. <laughs> you know, yeah. like when I when I come away from a wedding venue where they've clearly charged like twelve, fifteen to twenty thousand pounds for a couple to come in, and they've got cheap as the light bulbs that have got. They basically give you epilepsy. They've got such a terrible refresh rate. <laughs> and you're trying to photograph a ceremony that's got all this beautiful architecture and all these chairs and all the all the money that's been spent on ribbons for the chairs and the decorations and the flower arch and the dress and the groom's suit and everyone's there in their best outfit, hopefully. <laughs> and and you get 
awful lights that you, you basically have to shoot at like one thirteenth of a second to beat the refresh rate on them. Yeah. It's weird how you can get angry about that stuff. Um, but the good thing about having you here for this, I think, is that we can kind of approach a few different angles of you basically hold a lot of cards in a photographer's mind here because you're a wedding photographer mm -hmm. and you also run a wedding photography business. It's not like you're, you know, you turn up, you get paid 250 quid and then you, you know, you give them a card and you piss off home basically. Yeah. You, you run a, a business and you've run it very well. Um, year on year growth has been crazy. You know, we're living a much better life because of you than we were five, six years ago, entirely down to you. Oh, um, thank you. And then on top of that, you're the wife of a photographer. So not only have you seen how I'm affected by photographing weddings, you've also been the wife of someone who photographs models. And we've had some moments, let's say, yeah, um, with bizarre characters and, and whatnot. And we can certainly get to that at some point. And then you were also a bride. Yep. So you went through the process of being married, of, of getting married and being photographed and being that bride that regrets the way that the photos were handled on the wedding day. Yeah. So there's tons of perspective here. And one of the things, before we disappear from weddings completely, I actually, um, I have notes. I know, I can I, see you're I, really I prepared. prepared. So <laughs> Lots I, of notes. I found this absolutely dreadful article. <laughs> I'm not going to name the website because they don't deserve the advertising clicks. Um, but it was um, questions that, that uh, prospective brides should be... Oh, prospective brides? No, no, not potential brides. That brides. Soon-to-be brides. Yeah, soon-to-be um, brides. That'll do. Uh, should have for their wedding photographers. Now, not it's not for their wedding photographers. It's for any wedding photographer they interact with. So before they've booked, on initial contact, these are questions that they should ask. Okay? So just, just fire these questions out. Is that what they're getting at? You should, yeah, you should send this list of questions to the photographer or you should ask these questions in the meeting. Considering I do the admin about 97% of the time, I'm now deeply concerned that there's a couple pages worth of I think of I've already there. told you how many there are, so we won't play a guessing game, but there are 39 questions you should apparently ask your wedding photographer. And I think we can narrow them down. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to try and do. <laughs> I love it. That's what we're going to try and do. Okay, so we're going to go through this. Okay. The first question is fairly useful. Okay. So number one is, do you have my date available? Yes, that is actually, that is the most important question. Interesting point though. Not our date, my date. Interesting perspective there from the Bride Advice website. This is, at, well, that's actually very com common. Yep. Yep, very, very common. But but still, the date is the most important thing. Number two on this list is possibly the stupidest question. So we might peak a bit early here. Okay. And it's one of those ones, it's a slow burn stupid. Like this won't <laughs> sound stupid because it's contextually, it sounds like an ordinary question. Okay. But when you start to actually unpack it, it's a really stupid question. So number two, how far in advance would I need to book? Oh, sweet Christ. So it sounds contextually fine. But as, as we've been in this business for a while now, immediately I am... So to answer the question for anyone that's thinking I'm being a bit harsh on that question, you need to book as soon as you want that person to definitely turn up on your date. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Do not go around inquiring to 100 people, know that you found your photographer and delay it for as long as humanly possible because yeah. you will lose that photographer and then you get the sad face emojis, the crying, uh, oh my God, I'm so sad. Oh my day, how am I going to find anyone like you? Well, you should have gone with it originally. So I mean, not just that. Question. Um, what's the photo Let's just flip that a second. The other side of the coin here. What's the photography business model where you say... You need to book me in six months. What is the answer going to be from a photographer other than you need to book me now? If, my, really if I'm question. available, you should book me now. Yes. Because, because then you've got me. Yeah. Like I can't hold a date for six months and say, 
are, but I said six months ago that for some reason it would be absolutely vital that they wait six months before they attempt to book me because reasons. Yeah. People, we're people booked don't... up. We, we're not booked up, but we have bookings up to what? Early 2022? Yeah, we've got two bookings for 2022. Uh, There's a handful 12 for, for 2021. 21. Yeah. And next year... It's full. It's, it's full. It's pretty much full. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could probably find a way to squeeze in three at most. <laughs> but yeah, we are, we are full. So yeah, it just... If you, if you want to book your photographer, just go ahead and do it. Don't dilly dally back and forth. We're going to have to get through thirty nine, Lee. So I'm going to need you to cut out the the hallmark sentimentality <laughs> at the end of every single one. Okay. We need to laugh at a lot of these. Okay. So number three is pretty straightforward. How long have you been in business? I don't think that's the worst question in the world. It's not the worst question, but it's actually relevant. I don't know what, I, yeah, I don't know what information you really derive from it because if you've got an amazing photographer, but he's only just decided to get into weddings, then you might as well book him because you've got an amazing photographer. Longevity does does not equal the quality of work that's provided. No, as uh, I used to be told quite often, um, a photographer, quite a lot of photographers with 40 years experience have done the same year 40 times. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, okay. and that's the same for any business. Yep. How many weddings have you shot? Again, completely irrelevant. Yep. Uh, have you, sh- this is, this is, okay. So this is my personal favorite question. Okay. Okay. So we're talking about a wedding that hasn't happened. Okay. Have you shot any weddings similar to mine? How do you even answer that? What I don't know. I don't know what mean? your wedding is. What, what does that mean? I don't know. So we're just. That's stupid, stupid question. Okay. Don't uh, ask it. How would you describe your style? Now, I want to jump in here. This is mine. This, this is all mine. All um, look at my work. How I describe it doesn't mean anything. And if it's not the kind of work that you'd want, if I described it in a way that you like the way I describe it, it wouldn't make the work any more appealing. And if I, if you like the work and I describe it in a way that you don't like, what do you not book me on that basis? It's a ridiculous question. Yeah. And then the next question for ages, because I wrote this up at about three in the morning <laughs> <It doesn't laughs> while, I, while I was me. exporting stuff. <laughs> and the next question, it took me a while to realize wasn't the same question because of the way they'd worded it. So I've worded it slightly differently. How would you describe your working style? So oh. this one is actually a fairly decent question. And I think when you think about grooms, it's a decent question because it's basically, to me, the question is how involved do you get with the movement of people and the posing of people? Yeah, I get it. But do you know what my answer to that would be? Go read the reviews. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't mean to be funny. We don't but want to sound mean, Jamila. No, no, I'm not sounding mean. But the thing is, is that we can describe ourselves to be absolutely fantastic. You could say anything. Yeah, but if you describe your working style, let's say as natural... Or or reportage or or reportage if you're from where I'm from, not reportage. Mm. Reportage. Um, then people might say, okay, well, we want someone that's not going to be too hands on in how we are. They we just want them to photograph what's unfolding. Yeah, that's fine. But I actually think you can probably tell that from the work. Yeah, you can tell that from the work, but you also need something to back up. When we we get asked that question enough and i always say that we, we we shoot things quite naturally nothing is really planned everything's reported style but you can also go and read the references and you can see from the work whether you think what i'm saying is is true it's also quite funny that i i don't know if this is just me that's noticed this but the vast majority of weddings where they are very keen to not have someone that's overly posy ask for three thousand formal photos oh yes um we up to question five we're up to eight oh wow and i've now got to try and read my own (laughs) oh god (laughs) Uh, okay so if your work is candid would i still get formal photos i guess that's a a relevant question to the fact that like i don't post a lot of group photos for the simple reason that i don't think it's fair to the people in the group photos and i don't think anyone's ever going to book me based on a group photo it's true it's not fair to people in group photos but also as a as a previous bride, I... Maybe future bride, you never know. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't look at a group photo because a group a formal group photo is just people in a photo. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not really artistic. It's just people stood there like statues. So that doesn't tell you... Your group photos won't tell you about your entire wedding style. So it's... it's, uh, it's a, to me, it's a moot point, but... Uh, number nine, digital or film or both? 
I think that one was redundant about four years ago, five years ago, when the last of the people shooting weddings on yeah, it's digital, not. It's a bit of a dated film, question. Yeah. Um, this one's quite good, um, and I'd love to know where you go from answering no to this question. Uh, can you shoot indoors as well as outdoors? Just look at the portfolio. Yeah, but it's but what's the question? What? Like what? I don't understand what the question is. That the function of pulling on the tendon that presses the shutter button doesn't work when you're indoors, but it will work when you're outdoors. Or that the camera won't work outdoors, but you will indoors. Maybe it just has something to do with natural light and studio lights. Maybe people are thinking, well, if you if you have a bunch of lights Maybe, indoors, yeah, absolutely, possibly. But again, it's these are a lot of questions that I really feel. Consider right, the thing is, is I'm not being cruel to brides. And to grooms that don't know the answers to these questions. But I don't believe that there are bride and grooms out there that can't figure out about 90% of the answers to these questions by looking at the work that has led them to contacting you in the first place. Yeah. Um, don't really understand this question. Do you have an updated portfolio? I'll be honest with you. I get asked that a lot. What does that mean? Uh, do you know what? I don't know. As in, know. like, can we see the last wedding you shot? Yes. Okay. And, and the, 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 well, like, okay, okay, so there's a bit of sense to that, I guess. I, I, I say the question should probably be, is your portfolio up to date? Yes, the, that should be the question. But when 90% of the of inquiries will come through Facebook, you can see the timeline of most recent wedding. So it is... So the next couple are pretty straightforward. Uh, can I give you a shot list? We get that yeah. so often. That's that's pretty standard. Uh, are you the photographer who will shoot the wedding? That's a fair. That's a fair question. Especially considering... based on <laughs> yeah. the conversations that you're having on Monday with the videographer who's from an agency. Yes, um, and it's becoming more and more of a thing, I guess. Yeah. So maybe I don't. I don't know if it's a thing in wedding photography, but in England, it seems to be a thing with videography. Definitely a thing with videography, but that's a fair question. Yeah. Uh, what type of equipment do you use? This one's mine. <laughs> 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 um, if you're out there and you're getting married. Okay, and you are contacting photographers and you are asking them what camera they use. What I'd like you to ask yourself is, A, do you know enough about photography to even know what their answer means? Because if you don't, the question is redundant. But furthermore, and this is the important part, I used to be a chef. Are you asking your caterers what stoves they are using? Because if you're not, if you're not asking them what kind of knives they're using, then you have no use for the answer to that question. If yeah. the, if if I say I'm using a Canon A7R three, which isn't a camera that exists, it's just a mashup of two Sounds different super cameras. Good though. The majority of people asking this question wouldn't even know what you're saying, so they'd be fine with it. And I remember actually a wedding we did earlier this year when. We did the meeting because they wanted to talk about potentially booking. She brought her bridesmaids along and one of the bridesmaids finished with that question. That was the last question they asked before they left. And I just called her on it. And I just said, I could give you any answer and you wouldn't even know what I'm saying. And she said, oh, that's true. And I said, so I understand kind of the fear that's behind that question, but it's not a helpful question unless you are a photographer, in which case... You wouldn't have got to this point in this list. Yeah. Um, is there a backup plan? That's a very open-ended question. It's like I said to uh, someone who booked us recently, I can't help it if God wants rid of me and hits me with a meteor. I'll, I'll tell you, there are obviously pros and cons to that. Backup plan is if you fall sick, is there someone else to replace you? Or um, if uh, you cancel what happens as a result to us. I, I get yep. those questions. Yep. I, I despise the I despise the questions such as, well, it, what happens if you die? We've actually do you know what it's funny you say that. I've literally just had it occur to me. We turned down a wedding a couple of years ago. We based actually on that. returned their money. They paid. The, and one, the, the one I'm thinking no the one I'm thinking of isn't that one. Oh. So I don't know which one that is. Oh, but okay. the one I'm thinking of was the one where they wanted a, a an NDA essentially on the photos they wanted no photos to go out to the public and not to be available and they went back and forth with us and because of a referral and the fact that we knew a few people that they knew 
and they were asking for a discount and you know we were kind of obliging to a lot of the demands that they were putting forward and then there was the point where she, i'm pretty sure it was her said or he had had the problem and she brought it up that they wanted some kind of redundancy in place that if i die their photos get deleted from my hard drive so that no one else can get their hands on them because they wanted to know basically what was in my will for who gets it's the my same hard couple. drives. That's the couple they I'm had already about. paid. They'd already paid. Okay, so that that's yeah that and that, that's, that's the, the point where you think okay, there's no trust in this. I don't really feel like I can photograph your wedding. It feels like there's some kind of bizarre yeah thing going on. So anyway. also, if you're dead, slightly more important. <laughs> I also just, don't think that, let's, let's say, let's say, you know, touch wood, I'm not talking about something that's going to happen here, but let's say me and you perish in a car crash. M my mum gets hold of my hard drives. I hardly think the first thing she's going to do is go rooting through to find a wedding from two years ago so that she could publish them on Facebook to get back at someone who she's never heard of about a contract dispute that she doesn't understand. You kind of have to question what these people are thinking. Yeah, I don't know. So <laughs> each to their own, I guess. We might sound like complete weirdos on that and everyone else can't see the point. So that's the danger of this entire exercise. But then do tell us if if. Yeah, we I'd, are. I'd actually love to hear what we're <laughs> missing. Um, do you shoot other events on the same day? This has to be an American question because I can't imagine an English wedding where when I'm done with the wedding, I go off and photograph. I'm too tired. A boxing event, or, yeah. So I'm sorry, I'm too tired. I, I want some America, nuggets Ameri on the way home. American weddings start at like five in the evening. They're late, so it's yeah. a bit different. Uh, how will you be dressed? One we've had quite a few times. I find that question funny every single it's time. It's funny, but do you know what? Fair, fair point. Considering we've seen other members of the photographic community and video and Com video video community mainly video community and how they come dressed like they've just gotten out of the shower or rolled out of bed or come dressed like they are a guest at the wedding there's a f there's well, a the, difference i have to say the bravest i've seen so far was the the gentleman earlier this year who wore shorts uh and not formal ones that no was, so was, cash yeah um can other people take photos? This is actually something I actively fight on wedding day, so I can't see a problem with this. There's people that are terrified to get their phones out during group photos mm. and take photos. I guess they've had some kind of issue in the past where people have asked them not to take photos. I don't see the problem with it. I actually find it quite helpful if you get those people involved. Yeah, it makes it makes the whole experience a bit more fun and they see that you're not very you're not so rigid as a photographer yep. and so strict. But there must be photographers out there that don't allow them although we do have to say though that when it comes to the couple shots we go off on our own and we don't allow other people to come with us but that's more to do with making sure the couple are comfortable yeah. with having their photos taken but yeah there I, must be I people out there that say no what, i also don't know on what authority i could turn around and tell people they're not allowed to take photos at a venue that i don't own on a wedding day that isn't mine i mean to be honest with you the cheek of it yeah um but it obviously happens like you say um have you been to my venue before this question i find personally to be a little bit tedious for the simple reason of I won't suddenly become a completely different photographer because the venue you've picked has the walled garden on the left as opposed to the right at another <laughs> venue if you know what I mean yeah I know what you mean yeah um but we do get that from time to time and then the next few are, are fairly straightforward uh, time of arrival which is actually rarely asked which is bizarre um it's rarely asked, but when it is, it's okay. What time's your ceremony? Oh, well, we don't know yet. Yeah, I can't really help you then. <laughs> uh, do you do overtime? And if so, is there a charge? Now, I have to say that it's the second part of that question I find quite irritating, um, because if you're booking someone on a ten-hour contract, but you just decide that you're going to make the day last fourteen hours and you want them to be there for all fourteen, of course they're going to charge for the extra forty percent work that they're going to do. Um. Are you insured? That's fair enough. What is a deposit? That's fair enough. Do you have payment plans? Not enough people do. It's actually quite helpful for people. Yeah. Uh, your refund and cancellation policy. See, these now we're at the meat of what is actually a useful question. But you see, those are interesting questions. and, and th They're actually helpful if you're a They're abroad. helpful, yeah. Uh, travel costs. Uh, what are your packages and extras, which I think is hilarious to have it at that point. This feels like it's really out of order. In yeah. terms of out, out, as in out of the necessary mean, yeah. order, not it's out of order. Um, can you assemble slideshows on the day? So, uh, I guess that's I a, think that's an that must be an American thing because I don't. I don't know at what point in an English wedding you would even bring that up. 
Um, I mean, I edit photos during the meal and send them over a couple so they've got something for social media, but that's more five to eight photos. It's not like yeah. I'm going to do a full slideshow and I have no interest in that either. Uh, do you retouch? I don't understand the question. I'm assuming it means do you do any editing at all? The question for me would be more about whether they're look. Uh, my immediate question back would be, well, to what extent do you consider retouching? Like, are you asking, am I going to do skin work on every single guest? Then no. Yeah. Um, again, it's people's misinterpretation of what photography actually is. Um, this one really showed the age of the person that wrote the article. Um, number 30, how long for the proofs? Um, Good God. Yeah, that shows the age a little bit. In other yeah. words, how long until they can get the work and will it be online? Um, how many images which should have been covered in the packages? Uh, do you help creating the album? Again, that should be covered in the packages, but I guess to an extent it's something that could have been brought up earlier. This one, this is how it was written, so I'm not um, I'm not making this up. It just said ordering process. So I don't know if that meant to order prints. I don't know if that meant to complete the booking of the photographer. It's I a guess bit of a vague prints. question. It definitely needs a specific, but I would I would assume prints. Okay. That's uh, what I would assume from that. Um and the next one said digital negatives, unlimited downloads, question mark. Which I'm I'm assuming basically means can they have the raw files? No. No. And do they have unlimited downloads? And that would depend on the package. So again, you would have already covered this. Yeah. Um you have, oh, this was important. So this was very important. I've actually put brackets next to this one because this is very important. <laughs> this is what it said. So okay. it said, as a number for a question that wasn't a question, Okay. on a list of questions. <laughs> this article, honestly, writing this at three o'clock in the morning messed with my head. I bet it did. It said, demand a list of references from your photographer. Accept no hesitation. Now, okay, can I, I just want to step in here. Yeah. First of all, the photographer who is the person doing the work is not applying to you for the job. You as the client have are contacted them. them. Yeah. So no, that is the wrong way around. Secondly, demanding, rude. Yes. Just yeah. outright rude. The way it was written was fantastic. Yeah, just outright rude. Thirdly, if you... Am I on three? Yes. Thirdly, if you want to... Um, You're on the third point of question 35. <laughs> oh, God. Thirdly, if you want to... If you want to find out what... If you want to reference, so to speak, then that is the wonderful world of Facebook business because Facebook, there are reviews there. There are reviews on all it sorts. It comes up at the top. And most places... I mean, we keep our reviews on our Facebook page, but on the, some people have them on their website as well. You know, or you can you can also click on the person's name that's left the review and you can private message them and ask them. I know this because we've had clients who have booked us that have also said, oh, by the way, I've read your reviews, but I contacted these clients as well who also confirm what they've yeah. written in the review. Yeah. So A little bit of go. due diligence, I guess, on the part of the... Of the yeah. What room. are they going to ask if you're You've DBS missed my point, next? Though. You've missed my point, which we bring up quite a lot. Oh God, I missed it. What was it? The no hesitation part. Let me ask you a question. How many times in the in the six years you've watched me photographing weddings have I been, for want of a better phrase, ankle deep in a wedding <laughs> and someone's messaging asking for the ins and outs of a duck's arsehole? Many a times. And have got annoyed because on a Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon I'm not immediately responding to them and they're going to get married on a Saturday at two o'clock. Yeah. So that was the part that I think it sets. The problem is, I think articles like this, I'm not so much blaming the people that would use this information, but I think it's very detrimental to the people that would use this information because they would then approach vendors as if, like you say, we're all uh, dogs begging for a biscuit. When in actual fact, if you want it, okay, so if you want a ready meal and you go to Tesco's, Okay, you don't go into Tesco's and grab the ready meal and go up to the counter and say, why shouldn't I go to Sainsbury's and get this? What makes you think I would want this? Yeah. You know, there has to be a, a certain amount of due diligence on your part. Do you want it? Yes or no? Yeah. And, you know, have you, you know, do you know what you're actually holding on to? Like you go and pick up a chicken ready meal and you're like, why isn't there beef in this? Yeah. Um. So I think, I think that side of things, it just shows... 
a list like this is just made by someone who's trying to say more than there is needed to be said. Yeah, and actually, to be honest with you, making the whole booking process and the whole finding a photographer process far more complicated than it needs to be. And now you're going to get annoyed. This is my favourite question. Did you, oh, this is my really? favourite question for you. Oh, no. Okay, so I don't want you to go off on one because I think with the mood that you're in, this could take three hours for us <laughs> to get to get through. I'll try and keep it short. What sets you apart? What? Yes, that's the question you should ask your photographer. In other words, you should ask them to sit and beg. I'm sorry, no. I, I just think it's a disgraceful no, thing to no, ask. Absolutely what sets not. me apart is that you found my work and that you like it or you don't like it. And if you don't like it, that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. There are many of us out there who are all available, I'm sure, for your wedding day. And you will find the right one for you if you base entirely on work. Again, it goes back to my point. If you like my work and I say, well, what sets me apart is the fact that I have a beard, but I don't have any hair. That's not going to change their mind about whether or not they want to book me concerning the work. It would just be mm. a stupid reason to base a decision. What sets me apart as a photographer? I don't know. I'm married to half an Arab. <laughs> Just that half. Just the half. <laughs> I'm not married to the English half. I'm just married. To, like, I don't know what. I don't know what the question is. It's a stupid question, actually. It's 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 redundant and it's a waste of time. Don't bother asking it. Like you said, you look at uh, say take five people's work. You look at the work. We're going to get to. We're going to. We're going to. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Don't take over my format. <laughs> We're going to get to the point where we talk about what would be the good way to go about this, but I want to finish these okay. stupid questions first. Okay, that's a stupid question. Because after the 39 questions... Oh God, I forgot it was that many. <laughs> and we've still got three to go. <laughs> there's actually four you have to ask yourself. Wait, what? Yeah. What, as in the bride has to ask yeah, herself? Yeah, you ask yourself. Oh my as... God, I'm interested. Right, let's crack on. Okay, so the next three aren't particularly exciting because we've really peaked at number 36, I think, but... <laughs> Uh, have you worked with my videographer slash wedding planner before? Now, I don't know. I read this and I found this really funny at about three in the morning. The idea of a videographer slash wedding planner, given our history of videographers that we've worked with, where they couldn't plan a sandwich. <laughs> yeah. Um, that they would be doing both those jobs simultaneously, <laughs> which is how I read it. But um, to an extent, I can understand the videographer side of things. To an, ex to an extent. I'm saying to an extent. I can understand wondering whether or not they'll play nice. Mm -hmm. That I can understand. Yeah. Or maybe even looking for information about the videographer. Yeah. I will say, in the entire time that I've been a wedding photographer, I can comprehensively put money down that I've never been booked after the videographer. Uh, yes. Um, number 38 said contract question mark so i said yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes yes contract yes. and uh what info is needed before the day which is the best question to ask after you ask 38 questions about a day that we know nothing about but are supposedly supposed to beg for it's like question three right then now questions to ask yourself young bride okay i'll pretend i'm young bride and this is now i i'm going to have to interpret what they meant because it was written so poorly Okay, I'll help. Do you get along? Which they mean, do you get along with the photographer that you've approached? But the way it was written was like, are they asking about the bride and groom? <laughs> so do you get along? Uh, are you connected with their photos? Are you comfortable with them? Which is the same as question one, but we needed a question three because we're a bad author on a crap online blog. Yeah. And this is my favourite one. This is my absolute favourite one because for, especially as a kid that misbehaved a lot in early secondary school and got put in front of people that had feelings that would tell me that I needed to calm down. Very frequent. Did they listen and respond? Which is so patronising. I could totally reverse that question, to be quite yeah, honest with you. Yeah. Okay, so let's make this a useful exercise rather than let's just rag on this no, terrible It, it is a useful exercise because we're going to take what is wrong or miscommunicated in that and turn it into a positive. The most important things I would say when you approach, when it comes to the conversation, you should have already done your due diligence and have liked their work. There is no point approaching a photographer unless you liked their work. It doesn't matter if you like their price. It doesn't matter if you like their location. It doesn't matter if you like their logo. It doesn't matter if you liked that they photographed one of your friend's weddings. It doesn't matter anything else. 
if you don't like their work, the whole exercise is going to be pointless. So that's the most important thing. I do agree, and it wasn't really brought up until the ask questions to yourself, do you get along? I actually think this is one of the things that I, when we do uh, phone calls or Skypes or FaceTimes or meetings with potential clients, I don't, I don't beg for business full stop. I don't need to, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's right to. Yeah. And I will say to every single client, potential client that I've ever had a meeting with and I always do this last without fail I say to them if it's between me and someone else and you like their photos please book them yeah if if it's the case that you prefer their photos to mine please book them yeah because I would much rather you had that than you go with me for any other reason yeah I agree 100% and from there the 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 basis of the approach should be to find out if you would get along with the person. So you like the photos, will you get along with the person? Because as a bride, you're going to be around the photographer more than anybody else on your wedding day. Not one yes. person is going to be around you more than the photographer. Yeah, that is that is completely true. But also, I'm just going to play devil's advocate for this as well. With the whole getting along with them, are we talking here pre-booking process? Because, you know, you could have one conversation with somebody over Messenger, which is, I'd say at least 80% of our bookings are through through that method. Right. So, okay, do you think you can get on with someone based on how they write things to you? Is it going to be a phone call? Do they have to come and meet you? How many times does that person have to come and meet you to know? You mean how elaborate is the process to yeah, find out? Yeah, because, thinking about, because you think about it in a practical way and in a business way, if we did that, for every single client, if we were insistent on that, let's meet you guys, let's see how much we mesh, Yeah. then we're going to spend more time doing that than actually photographing weddings. Yeah, and so, we have to substantially reduce the amount that we photograph weddings and hike our prices up to make up for the lack of work. Yeah, I think I think you can you can gain that through a conversation over the phone, you can gain that through a conversation of Messenger. I don't or, think it needs to be a particularly long conversation, but what it definitely mm. shouldn't be is an ask and respond. No, it shouldn't because be. Because an ask and respond, when someone's trying to, to siphon money off of you, they're going to say whatever you want to hear. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas I think if you have a back and forth, the first thing almost always when we have people say, Oh, is there any chance we can have a chat over the phone or can we meet up or whatever? There's no conversation to be had. They don't have any questions. They almost just want to see A, if you're a real person. Yeah. And B, are you I don't know if you look like a murderer or something, which unfortunately I kind of do. <laughs> um but what I what I always say to them, the first thing I say to them is just tell me about your day. Because then the shoes on on their foot, the balls in their court, and they get to talk about their day, and then they can almost observe how I respond. Yeah. And there's two of them generally, and one of me. Yeah. So one can watch while the other one responds, and vice versa. And when I'm responding, they can both listen to what I'm saying. And like all couples, like we do, when you go away from someone, we we will say to each other, "Well, what did you think of when they said such and such?" And you'll go, "Well, I thought it was alright," and I'll go, "No, I didn't like it." Yeah. And then you work out, you know, the differences from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, shit article. Quite funny. <laughs> I just thought that would be quite a funny exercise because I know how much you enjoy your admin. So if we can turn a corner very slightly, uh-huh. s- pretty much as soon as I got a camera, I think my first, I, it was, is that the date in front of me? I believe it was the 13th or 16th, something of January 2013. I shot my first model. It was January sixteenth. Yeah, it was, it's in that ball. I, I feel like it's thirteen, but it doesn't matter. It's the beginning, mid of January twenty thirteen. I shot my first model, and I'm doing air quotes. Um, and since then, I, I, and I went nuts. Like I photographed nonstop two or three models a week for two years. Yeah, I went nuts because I have a thing of just go at it. Yeah, like just just like if you can't get over the wall, run through it. <laughs> um, so h- how is it? being the wife of someone who's spending time around models? To be honest with you, um, a lot of people... <laughs> Sorry, our chihuahuas just decided to have a sneezing Bless fit in you, the background. Bless you, Tika. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Um, I think a lot of people... Well, sorry, not a lot of people. I think we're talking husband and wives. I think a lot of wives in this position, um, and I've met them, have a disdain for it. They don't like it because they have uh, negativity towards the model, um, jealousy. They think that the husband's going to run off and cheat. They think the husband likes being around these 
uh, models for other reasons. I guess reasons. we could file all of that under nefarious. Under nefarious, yeah. Um, but uh, I'm, I think I've only met maybe one or two wives of photographers who are probably similar to me in that it's your job at the end of the day. And I think the basis of it comes down to our relationship um, and how we are as a couple. So we have always been very honest with each other. Um, If we wanted to do something, we explained to each other, we went off and did it. You've always been open with me from the beginning about photographing models. And you said to me, I want to do portrait work for this reason. I want to do um, headshots for this reason. I want to photograph this model because I like the hair. I like the jawline, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. When it came to, because there was a point where you transitioned and you you did do some photographs, you did some uh, art nude work yeah. um, and you did some high fashion work that had some nudity in it as well. Yeah. Um, before you did that though, you had that conversation with me I think really to see if I would be okay with it um, and how I felt about it. It's fine. It's not a problem. And the reason why I never had a problem with it was because I knew it was part of your job at the end of the day. It was what you were doing. Um, And if you want to be stupid enough to go down that route, then uh, there'll be repercussions for it. But you weren't like that, you know, you weren't that sort of person. And the other thing is that every single shoot for, I want to say three is probably up until last year where work became quite difficult for me to n- be with you. But I think for three, maybe four solid years, <clears throat> excuse me, I was on every single shoot with you. So I, and I even went through the booking process with you. So you'd, you'd put out a casting models would apply or vice versa. And you'd ask my opinion on them and you'd say, what do you think about this? So from the very beginning, you were just, open about everything, you know, and you involved me in everything. So I never, and never worried like other wives would do. Um, and actually found it quite a fun exercise because it meant that you were involving me in something that you were interested in. It was a hobby that then became a job. Um, so how much of the, of the process being easier was down to you seeing how pissed off I got with some models? Oh, probably about 90% of it. You could tell I wasn't coming home from shoots with anything other than sometimes just plain disdain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and also it's um, also meeting the type of people that you're shooting with. So it, it, cause it got to a point where when, especially when you started doing agency work and that you're working with a lot more models um, where I'd be off at work and then you would be photographing models in our studio. You would go to a studio and you'd work there and it was just, uh, that's your job. People would say to me, well, isn't that weird that your husband's off shooting models? I'm like, why I'm here working with you guys. Do you think he thinks this is weird? So I saw, always saw it as it's a weird a job. It's a weird stereotype that photographers have got. I remember having a conversation with, I'm not going to say who, uh, for the sake, I can tell you afterwards, but I think you probably know, but I had the conversation about whether or not I was being fair to you was, was what was being asked of me. Uh, because isn't the general impression that I would be, up to no good if I'm spending my time around these models. Yeah. And like, I, I don't really know how to answer things without being an asshole. Sometimes I don't know how to <laughs> answer them in the normal way. And my response genuinely was, am I shagging the men as well? <laughs> it's a really good response. Um, but it's like you say, I think you probably find there are probably more people shagging in offices than there are, on photo shoots, generally speaking, yeah. the majority of photographers don't look like Ryan Gosling. I certainly don't. Believe me, I've met many photographers. It's very rare that you'll find one that is Ryan Gosling-esque, yeah. if at all. And to be completely honest with you, it might be the scariest thing for some women to hear, but there are men out there, I am one, that the personality matters a lot more than the looks full stop for yeah. me to not want to throw someone out a window. <laughs> and it's above 51% that that has not been particularly great. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you did a short stint of photographing models yourself and you stopped. Um. Why? I think it got to the point really where I was just tired of them. And I, I, I need to obviously, I think, buffer this and explain that this is not every model I've ever shot. There are 
some lovely models out there, very professional. But unfortunately, there are um, a minority, which I think have now become the majority of models, which have no working ethic. Um, have work ethic. Work ethic, yes. Yeah, sorry, Working that's ethic. Work ethic. They have no ethic that is <laughs> currently in operation. God, they've got no work ethic. Um, and they basically, I mean, I witnessed people come into house, even though to shoot with me, who would sit there twiddling their hair, fluttering their eyelids, thinking they were going to get something else from this. Well, they or, wouldn't have to work as hard if they were flirty. Kind yeah. Of thing. And I, I have disdain for people like that because I think that if you're paid to do a job, you do a job. That's how you, and you should work 110% yep. at the end of the day. You want your money, you work 110%. Um, Let's just go for it right here. Let's just bring it up right now, especially considering the hourly rates that some charge. When, oh, when you consider, I think yeah. this is very particular to you, you come from working in the care industry where people are paid an absolute tiny percentage of what some models charge and some of the highest charging models can push as hard as possible to do as little work as possible and want as much sympathy for what they've done yeah it's definitely one of those reasons why i gave up photographing them their rates are ridiculous and then to top it all off it's will add in extra travel and the travel's ridiculous because as i always say well i don't get paid to travel to my work from my home my staff don't and things like that so why is it different you know I think, why, I think why, okay so if i played devil's advocate because that's got to be my position here otherwise this is just going to turn into a bullying if i played devil's advocate my my point would be to say well you travel to the same building to and from you have the option to move closer to that building and incur lower travel costs whereas someone who is getting sporadic work in various places will always have to Mm -hmm. pay extra for the travel and to be devil's advocate to my own devil's advocate what i'd say is well maybe don't take work that's so far afield but i think i actually think the the underlying problem so we've encountered a lot and i'm not trying to take the the you know, the rubber off your road here at all. But I think the underlying problem we have here is that there'll be people that think that you can't Google how much a train ticket costs. And we've had Mm. someone say it will cost them 40 quid to get a train three stops. Yeah. Or they'll say that the petrol will cost them 100 quid because it's a round trip. And I think they think that a round trip means that you have to do a complete (laughs) circle yeah, but and 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 this that that is that is essentially what I was getting to, and also it's it's usually the people that irritate me with the high rates and the travel are the people that work the least, yeah. as in they put in the least amount of effort. They walk in, they spend more time on their phone than they do actually focusing. You know, you're here, you're paid to do a job, so you should do it. I have never begrudged. We've we've paid lots of models, um, and you've paid lot. We've paid for lots of models just to photograph with me, and I've never had an issue with paying models and their travel if they've actually brought something and they're working hard. No problem at all. It's those that don't, and unfortunately, there's too many of them at the moment yep. that don't work but think they should earn hundreds and hundreds from it. Well, I talked it's about one this of my with, reasons. With David Shukri, I talked about this, and God, I hope I've just pronounced his name right. It's been a long week. <laughs> um, but I talked about it with him, and, and he seems to think that, that actually it's not um, as bad as maybe what I think it is in terms of the number of decent to terrible models. The, mm-hmm. the ratio is not as bad as I think. You think it is as bad as I think, and I'm inclined to always think that I'm right because if I'm talking, I tend to be right. <laughs> yeah. That's the way I like to think of myself. Um, obviously, the other issue that we've had, and I definitely don't want to go on a long tangent with this, is the issue of with English law and the way that the way that the, the culturally it works in England. If you're a photographer and you hire a model for your own purposes to photograph, that th- there are models that think they have an inherent right to use those photos for self promotion. And they can just screenshot them or they can just save them on their phone and then use them on their Instagram, use them on All whatever. All comes down to work ethic, the whole lot. Yeah, and mm. it's the idea that they are apparently worth, you know, 50, 60, 70 pound an hour. But also your work is so worthless that they use it for advertising. There's a real weird dynamic there that you're not worth paying. You're not worth, 
even the 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 idea of a discount, let's say, yeah, by way of okay, well, if I can have a few photos, then you know it would be really helping me out because I like your work. So maybe we do it for like this much instead of this much. That they'll charge you that full amount. They'll sit on their phone. The first question they've got is, do you have a plug for a charger? And the second one is, what's the Wi-Fi code? And then you have to. I mean, there's there's a very prominent model in England that. I booked for an hour of a studio day back in 2016, an hour of a studio day. And following on from the studio day, they were doing a workshop. And I'd never been to a photography workshop before at this point. So I booked the last hour of the studio day and then attended the workshop with the intention of basically scouting them for whether or not I could use them for my workshops. Mm -hmm. And for the hour that I had them booked, they ignored what I'd asked them to do, which was basically just asking for a particular outfit because I'm doing this type of work and I showed them yeah. an image. Can you just go chuck this stuff on? And they'd go and sit on their phone and be answering questions on Instagram or, or whatever they're doing. Mm. And twice I had to have a conversation saying, look, you know, I've only got an hour yeah, and I've asked you twice now, is there any chance you could do this or I'm not going to pay? Yeah. And when you've got someone who's probably in the top five most prominent models in terms of internet photographers booking them. And they have the, the, the less of a work ethic than like a year eight at secondary school. You're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, and because they're successful because of some of the extracurriculars that they'll throw in, mm. and I'm leaving that purposefully vague so that people can get annoyed about it. You're kind of at a loss as to how the industry can self-correct when it, being a twat is being rewarded. Yeah, it's but being a, a but being a twat when you're when you're a woman in a in a male-led industry is fine. Yeah, that's yeah. The, that's the main thing. If you can, like you say, flutter your eyelashes, yeah, and maybe push your arms together, yeah, then there are guys that will just go along with whatever you do, whatever you say. They'll they'll take any form of treatment just for the privilege of being around yeah. you, and you essentially become an escort. Mm. Yeah, it's that and it's the immaturity that goes with it. And I, I could no longer cope with that. And what's sad is that, and this has nothing to do with me, but it's sad that it it then can actually tarnish actual models. Yeah. Because, um, do you know, what? it sounds like we're so really like, ragging on yeah. all models, but we're not. There are there are wonderful, wonderful models out there. And I have really liked some of the people I've worked with. I went through a phase about a year ago of working with about the same seven people over yeah. and over again because I liked those people. Yeah. And I needed to limit my exposure to morons. Yeah. I mean, uh, quite often at workshops, people would say to me, well, Jamila, who would you recommend that I work with next? And there's always one name that comes up in my head immediately. They're like, well, you know, and I say to them, you should work with this person. They're like, oh, really? I'm I'm like this person's amazing super professional everything is amazing with you will get 210 percent from her all the time yeah and she is worth e absolutely every penny you pay her you know because it's it's the it's the booking it's the shoot itself and it's all the post stuff afterwards as well you you couldn't find you know you can't find enough people like that and that's what's a shame i wish that we had met more people like her and less of what we did meet as far as like going forward you obviously still work yes outside of our business yeah is is it something you would consider to be a full-time photographer yeah it's something i would consider um i think that it's something that i could definitely i think it's something i could definitely do um and something that i would enjoy but I also think there's a part of me that would probably need a little extra something as well because I need a very specific routine. I need stuff to be there for me to do. I need structure. So the self-employment um, side of it would be hard. Yeah, that's that's what, and I've always said to you, I would struggle with that. So I'd need to have like additional structure in place for my own personal well-being to be able to function properly. Um but it's definitely something I can see doing. Um to be honest with you, I'd probably just be a part-time carer. I'd be like a bank carer or something. Or go work at a dog's um, home or something. Yeah, go work at a dog's home. Um because I think that what we're doing is is very important. Uh, you know, as wedding photographers, we're giving we're giving things to people which if we'd have had the same thing we wouldn't be doing it yeah we wouldn't we, yeah we wouldn't be doing it but also those people that are no longer with us that we wish were yeah. the 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 memories that we would have from that would 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 be life-changing so i think that we're doing a very important job and at the same time i 
I think that there's always going to be a part of me that's going to want to care for others in a very practical way as well. So I can see it happening. Um, not now at this very moment, but I can definitely see it happening as something that I, I will definitely do with you. Okay. So it's time for just some quick fire questions. So let's try not to jamila these answers oh, too God, much. I'm terrible at this. Favourite part of a wedding to photograph? Bride prep. Why? I love, it's the ins and outs which nobody sees. Right. It's the only part of the day really that nobody else sees. Little bits that are on the dress, the garter, gifts that are given, those exchange of conversations between mother and daughter, um, the tears you see when when dad sees the daughter for the first time in a dress. It's those tiny little moments that I get to share and experience and I get to capture for people that I wish that I had as well. The part of the day at a wedding that you least like photographing? Speeches. <laughs> Yeah, you do hate speeches. <laughs> I do. You never do it, but you do no, hate speeches. No, when I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, the least like that. I, I, I think it's the, I don't find it very interactive. And because I'm stood up and everyone else is sat down, I feel like I'm, there's this beacon over me. So it, it's in something I will get over in time. I just have to kind of suck it up and do it. But And you're quite lazy. No, I'm quite lazy. And um, that's my admin time. <laughs> but no, but that, that's my, in all honesty, that's my least favorite part of the day. Okay. Um, and your current or your overall favorite lens. Or focal length. Oh, 35 mil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was, I'm torn between 35 and the 85 mil, but the 35 mil I, I use more during the day. So that's my lens, especially now something, I've got- Something we've actually never talked about. Do you find that the, I, I guess it might just be because you haven't had much choice, but <laughs> do you find shooting primes to be weird- because obviously I don't shoot zooms. No, so I feel you're zooms are weird. Okay. That's yeah. Fine. As I long love as primes. I haven't like pinned you at the corner, I've never worked it out that you're just over there miserable. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you have a zoom lens. And when I've gone to use that zoom lens, I stick it on the um, focal length I want. And then I walk to wherever <laughs> it is I need to go. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I think it makes me, me personally, I'm less lazy for using primes because I have to go to the subject or, you know, especially if I'm using something that's wider. So for me, that's the reason why, but I love it. Okay. And, and when you, when it comes to like you going through uh, images on the day, Mm -hmm. are you, are you chimping? I don't actually watch you shoot an awful lot. I'm watching if Mm, you're shooting sometimes, but things have changed, especially with the Sony coming in and with you being much more interactive yourself with what's going on. Like, yeah. I don't feel like I'm kind of double checking on you. Yeah. I don't mean that to sound condescending. No, no. Um, but are you chimping a lot? Are you checking the back of your camera a lot? Or is the fact that the Sony lets you do that before you're just kind of cracking I on? think for the majority of the day, because the Sony lets me see it before I don't, but there are two times during the day when I chimpy me. Can I guess? Time. Guess. First kiss. Am I'm, I gonna wrong? Wait, I'm gonna wait till you get okay. one. Yeah. So first kiss and uh, it's either the dad seeing the bride for the first time or it's the groom seeing the bride for the first time. It's actually both of those. When groom not sees the bride, first kiss, not the first kiss. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So not at least I got. Kiss. At least I got close. Yeah. And I tell you why because those are the two moments that only I'm doing. It's very rare for you to be in the room with me when dad sees them. The way them. you said that made me think you weren't talking English, but I've now understood oh. what you mean. <laughs> Sorry. Those yeah. are the past day that it's only you doing them. It's not me as well. That's correct. Yes, that's yeah. True. Whereas first kiss, I'm I know there, that yeah, yeah. if I've screwed up, you've got me covered. Okay. So you, you are the most experienced second shooter in the world, full stop, bar none. Um, just to put this in perspective for anyone that's listening, um, you photographed... All bar four weddings. So about 340 weddings. Jesus, that's a lot of it's, weddings. It's in that ballpark. That's a lot of weddings, yeah. I've just done 300. It, yeah, that's a lot of it's weddings. It's in that ballpark. Yeah, it is, yeah. Let's say 300 for the sake of stupid arguments. Yeah, Let's that's say true, 300. Yeah. You've, you've second shot for, for 300 weddings. Um, what What is it that makes a good second shooter? I don't actually feel like this is a question you can answer because I feel like it's the question the primary would answer. I actually want to ask you a different question. <laughs> well, I'll ask you that question. Okay, what that's fine. You can yeah. ask me that in a minute. But I want to ask you what makes a good primary? So what ma- Okay, so what, okay, what do good. I do that is good for you to be able to do your job? Okay, um, especially more so initially, because now I've got a bit more responsibility, but initially is not relying on me 100%. Right. For images and letting me be able to adapt and learn 
Um, well, and we did always have the, the thing I'd say to you, which was anything you get as a bonus, I'm not relying on a single photo. Yeah, so that's That's key. how you learn weddings. Yeah, yeah. that's key. Um, and it's not just you. Every person I have come in as a second shooter, I say to the same thing. It's, yeah. I'm not relying on you. Yeah. I don't think a, I don't think a primary should ever rely on a secondary. I think that's wrong. No, I don't think they should either. But no. Anyway. But obviously with the more responsibility that I get and when I'm shooting certain things on my own, then uh, then it comes down to you being able to trust me to do those. Right. So I think that's very important. You trust me to do bride prep. You trust me to, to get groom's first look and stuff like that. So and candids yeah. and things like that. So um it's so it's the uh I'm not Reliant it's that freedom, on, I guess. Yeah, it's that freedom yeah. where I'm not reliant on 100, percent especially initially. Um, and then when there are things that are solely my responsibility, that you have trust that I will do them. And if I've screwed up or there's a problem, you trust that I can come to you and tell you. Yeah. But also, I know that if I come to you and say to you, "I've fucked this up royally," yeah. you're not going to rip my head off and tell me to fuck off. Yeah. You're going to help me. You're going to support how to fix that so then or how not to do it in the future yeah and then the other thing is it comes down to the freedom as well but allowing that creativity um and yes pushing me into deep ends where i can just jump in and get on with it but also with my personality gradually pushing me into certain things so what like i think candids were a thing where i was terrified of candids i didn't want to be too close to people i felt too out there and it was part of you saying just keep doing it keep practicing you're getting there and all that practice then led to me i remember the wedding where i got stuck and i had to do it on my own you were off with the bride and groom yeah and photographing and i went off to the venue to meet you there and i got there and i was like oh shit i've got to do candids this room is freaking tiny it was actually probably one of the hardest yeah. weddings Fuck, to I do needed, candids yeah, at, yeah i needed 24 mil and i was like oh my god i'm shit with this focal you'd length have been, you'd have been less obvious if you'd have had air horns under your feet well you were Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And there were great big armchairs everywhere and I was sliding across the back of armchairs taking pictures and stuff. So it was the build up where you, you know, supported me going into it slowly and then being thrown at the deep end. And afterwards, when you came back and I was like, shit, I've done this. She was like, you, you're fine. Don't worry. But I think one of the things that helped you with the candids, I don't know if you know that I did this, was I told you to focus on threes and fives. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did that because then you were focused on the photo, not the situation. Yeah. So by what, okay, so to explain what that means, um, I didn't want candid to, like, what I see a lot of people do, I'll tell you who I see do this a lot, and I don't think it works at all, and he's a much better photographer than me, is Taylor Jackson. He does these, like, single candids of, like, a, a headshot of a person stood looking bored. Yeah, they're a bit and odd. And it's like, okay, it's sharp, and that's a lovely out of, de- out of you know, depth of field on the background and whatever, but... If I'm looking through that that collection of photos and you've got a picture of my uncle looking bored, but it's a really nice photo of my uncle looking bored, it's still just a photo of my uncle looking bored. I feel like bored. you're just ticking off the guests going, yep, got this one, body got count. that one. Yeah, body count, yeah. Um, so what I told you to do was to look for, generally at weddings, people talk in threes. You have a couple yeah. that talk to one person. You might get two couples talking to each other, but it's very rare. Yeah. Um, And then it's threes or fives. Yeah. But essentially what you do is you look for three people that are having a conversation or you pick a triangle of people out of a group and you have the one person in the middle who's facing towards you yeah. and the two people, one either side, that are facing towards him talking. And you yeah. get that picture because it's framed. It's frame within frame. You've got a triangle, which is a lovely compositional thing. Yeah. But it also is narrative. It tells you a story about the day. Yeah. And you sometimes have to listen to like the cadence of the voice to wait for like, oh, they're telling a joke. Here comes the funny bit. Let's get a picture of them laughing. Yeah. Um, but the other side of it is, and you can do you can do the complete inverse, which is the two of them turned around and the yeah. guy in the middle of his back turned that's a little bit more tricky. It needs to tricky. tell a story. They're like the picture needs to make sense. Exactly. It just needs to. It needs to be obvious what you are trying to tell with that picture. What that yeah. picture represents as part of the day. Um, and I think that took your mind off of things in terms of watching. Oh God, I'm stood in the crowd of people, and it became you became like me. I hunt people when I'm doing candies mm. now. I hunt people. I don't care if people are watching me. Yeah. So I'll go and sit at tables with people, and. The, you, you feel straight away that they're uncomfortable. And I always say the same thing to them, which is like, if I'm here, it means I'm not photographing you. Yeah. So you guys are fine. <laughs> so when you can't see me, it means I'm probably photographing you. Yeah. So for that couple of minutes, they're fine. And because you're in with guests, no one else is paying attention. Yeah. And I can hunt down certain people. Like, 
I get quite spiteful if someone tries to not be part of a candid. If they see me and they try and turn away or whatever, I'll hunt them down. I'll get them at some point. Oh, over you that see, day. my my trick is is when they're like, "Oh no, don't take my picture." I'm like, "Already got a hundred of you." What? Oh, and then they I so what, they, they kind of feel like, like, "Oh, screw it." Already, oh, okay. screw it. She's already done it. And you know what? Ninety nine percent of the time, it's the first time I'm photographing that person. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I said I said in other podcasts, I think that. And it's a bit of phrase I've used with you for 15 years, which is whatever you do, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. That's a very important thing. So so then on the flip side then, what makes a good second shooter? And you've had more experience of this because uh, you've had others. It's true. Um, I would say be very aware that you're representing someone else. Uh, something I find quite frustrating. I've seen it a couple of times where people think that if you're acting as a second shooter, that you are an a, a, a an alternate independent photographer. Yeah. But you'll be lumped in with me. So if you do something wrong, that reflects badly on me. And by wrong, I mean conduct. I don't mean take a bad photo. Yeah. Um, I, my job is to screen that, is to make sure that, you know, if you have taken one that hasn't worked or something you think was great that just doesn't do what I would want my work to do. Yeah. My job is to screen that. But I would definitely say uh, conducting yourself as if you are an extension of the primary in, in the way that you behave and yeah. dress and interact with people. Um, definitely don't talk politics with guests at all yeah it doesn't matter if the person you happen to be talking to agrees with something that you're saying someone else might not and it's not the place for it yeah um and we've had that before um stupid things uh the one we had in southampton earlier this year take the flash off your camera in a ceremony i don't care if it's not switched on because in the background of my photos there is a huge flash on top of a camera that makes the camera three times the size and makes it more of a distraction yeah and it also makes you more of a distraction to guests so people are more hyper aware of photographers so whilst it might be like not a big deal for how you're working it's actually a big deal for how i'm working yeah um one that we came up with well not one that we came across sorry this past week and I'm, I'm sure you won't be too pleased that I'll bring this up, but I think it's important that we're very transparent. And I'm absolutely fine with you bringing up some terrible stuff about me in return. Um, don't question whether or not I know what I'm doing in front of people. Mm -hmm. If you want to take me to one side or when we're on our own, just say, I don't know if you realise, but this was happening or I don't think you got this or, yeah. I, you know, I'd, I'd be... I'd, feel bad if I didn't bring it up and it turned out I was wrong yeah. but did you do x y and z but it's when the, the incident we had was you asking whether or not I had, I had taken a photo correctly in front of a groom mm -hmm. and I don't need that because I'm working on a certain level of trust with the people that have hired me yeah. and if they feel like me and you aren't on the same page then they're not going to be confident in what I'm doing yeah especially that we're married but as a second shooter, full stop. Mm -hmm. It's something that can be had, uh, a conversation that can be had privately as opposed to in front of people. Yeah. And then after that, to be honest with you, I mean, photographically, it's quite boring, but I would say, give me a mixture. Don't give me all headshots all day. Yeah. Because I, I don't have much use for that. If yeah. you're the, if you're shooting at the back of the ceremony, give me some wides, give me some, some close ups, give me some, um, Verticals. Some verticals. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that you're brilliant at. You give me you give me a great range of compositions. There's two reasons for that. One, I know that you're pretty much shooting horizontal the entire time you're at the front. And two, it's the only time that I'm stable enough to take a vertical photo and feel comfortable. Right. Because it's you're little. Yeah, because I'm little and having to turn the camera and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd say, yeah, giving a good mixture of 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 possibilities with with the photos that you provide and just don't try and be a primary yeah that's we've not had much of that but i've had it once with uh, a previous second shooter where um i don't want to say it became a competition but it became useless because you getting coverage of what i'm getting in the same way that i'm getting it doesn't benefit me and doesn't really benefit you either because less of your stuff is going to go in to the final wedding piece and I'm less yeah. likely to use you again. So you're kind of bleaching your own exposure 
yeah. to more weddings. In truth, there's really only one time I can think during the day where we're this, us two, where we should have our cameras on us at the exact same time. And that's the ceremony because we're shooting different perspectives of that ceremony front and back. Um, I, I, yeah. You know, as, as, yeah, no, as, I, I don't disagree as a with you. fundamental, yeah. I think the other times where it's useful is if um, during candidates, especially if it's a, if it's a very large group of people and it's over a, a very varied amount of space, um, then then that makes sense. And I think it can make sense for the dress sometimes when, especially like if I'm shooting all the close ups and that, that you can come from behind and be a bit well, wider. You're focusing on the actual dress. Yeah. I can focus on you the people. You can see and stuff yeah. like that. So, which means that I then don't have to come away but from But that's not a necessity. That, you do, that's you not do a necessity. what you do with the dress being put on so well that I'm yeah. not needed. But that that is a possibility. But I, other than that, I don't, I think when there's two of you, like you, it, this falls on the point that you said about the secondary not being a primary. Other than that, you, you know, you don't, if you're photographing, when you're photographing rings, I don't need to have my camera on. I'll tell you, you, okay, so I'll tell you something, something that I have noticed with pretty much every single secondary I've had, not including you, is they are always someone who is looking to either break back in or break into being a wedding photographer on the, in their own right. Yeah. They don't ask any questions. They don't ask any questions. They don't ask why we do something a certain way. They don't ask what the benefits of doing something a certain way. They don't ask, you know, what are you, even the, the questions that I would find quite tedious because of who I am, which is like, what lens are you using? Why, yeah. you know, for me, if you ask me a question about gear and the question doesn't involve the word why, I get quite bored because if you ask me what lens am I using, that's a boring question. Yeah. Um, I expect you to just look at my camera and figure it out for yourself because I'm busy photographing. Yeah. But if, if your question is what lens are you using and why, then we can have a conversation because you can learn a lot either to do things the way that I'm doing them or not. And I guess that comes from workshops as much as anything. Yeah. I say the same thing when I teach workshops, every single time I do a workshop, I try and say the same thing. I've been quite lazy lately, but it's to say, I'm not here to tell you the right way. I'm here to tell you the way that I do it. Yeah. And that if I do something you don't like, that's great. You can find out why I do it that way and never do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, cause if you understand the why of anything, you understand the how. Yeah. Generally speaking, if you can understand the motivation and the the reasoning, you can understand the basic how to. Yeah, definitely. So the lack of questions that I get is probably something that frustrates you. It's a bit annoying because you know, you're you're bringing someone in to give them an opportunity to shoot a wedding and there's not many people that do that anymore that give other people the opportunity without being scared that they're going to take your business or whatever. I don't really care about that. Um, and... To be honest, we thinking about it now, yeah, I if they're coming in and they're shadowing me, essentially, they don't ask me no questions. Mm. And they're there to essentially do my job. And but that's I, probably worse, to be honest with you, because at least with... When you're a second shooter and you've got someone teaching you how to second shoot... You haven't even got to worry about looking bad to the primary. I guess one thing with, especially with men, is they can be a bit scared of looking like they don't know it all. Yeah. So they they always pretend that they know something even when they don't. Whereas, when you know you you're not dealing with the primary, you can ask some questions. And I've told people all the time, like you know, if you don't understand something or you want to know why something's happening or what's next or you know, we don't even get asked to schedule. We don't get asked anything really. They just kind of. You have to go go over there and take some pictures. Oh, okay, and then yeah. just wander off. And that 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 side of it's a bit frustrating because, to be honest with you, you can probably see the writing on the wall with what they'll end up doing when it comes to weddings, which is not doing them for very long. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> um, okay, so to finish up, then I want to ask you three questions. Okay. If you could photograph one person, who would it be? Any person. Any person. Dead or alive. Yes. My mum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're still thinking. You're doing the eyes roll like, back. I'm my granddad, but my mum. Yeah. Your I mom. would love to photograph her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my second question would be, would you prefer if I wasn't a photographer? No. 
No. Because I've had a few careers, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've had a few careers and there are you're you're already very skilled and very qualified in several other things. Um and as much as I miss the fresh ciabatta on a Saturday morning for me to have <laughs> scrambled eggs with. Um no, I I love the fact that you're a photographer because it's it's actually I th- f- watching you, it's the first career you've had f- that has come from a hobby and you've had those in the past mm-hmm. where you really love it. Like you really, really love it and you love doing it as a job and it hasn't made you hate it as a hobby. Okay. So the last question is going to be horrible. (laughs) Oh no. (laughs) Does the fact that we provide people with wedding photos, the ones that they want, and we've got plenty of very good reviews. Mm -hmm. Does the fact that we provide people with wedding photos that they're happy with make you sad? that we don't have those wedding photos? Yes and no. It does make me sad because I wish that we had things like that, but I see the upside of it in knowing that those people didn't get what we had and they've got something that I'm so glad that we we can give them something that we don't have and that we'll never, we will never get that. Even if we renewed our vows, we'll still never get that because of the people that were there on the day. And I feel blessed that we can give them something that they can hold on to for hundreds of years. They can pass down in generations, you know, that what, you know, you know what I mean? That, you know, and when they're sat in care homes with really advanced dementia, family members can come in, carers can pick up a photo album. They can look through it with them and say, oh, these were your wedding pictures, you know, and there'll be something there. We're not going to end on that because that's a sour note, but I want to, I want to end. Okay. So we've, we've, it was positive, (laughs) but the question was a sour question. I want to ask, Do you have a memory in the time that we've been photographing memories that stands out as being particularly funny or particularly like it meant a lot to you in what you did on the day? Or is is there like, what's this standout moment for you as a wedding photographer? Um, And then you can totally ask me the same question. (laughs) In fact, I'll go first because then I want you to end. Okay. Okay. So... What's your standout moment? My, thank you. That's really kind of you to ask. Um, <laughs> so you remember we did a wedding in West Sussex and the, the layout of the day was the speeches were going to happen after the meal. So we go to have our break, you know, change batteries, change cards, whatever, what we used to do before we just bought bigger cards and more batteries. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> So we go off to to get sorted and we hear the microphone start and the speeches have started before the meal, which is not the plan at all. And they've even like in the last couple of minutes told us it wasn't the plan. Mm-hmm. So I go screeching back in, but because I've broken all my gear down, I'm putting lens back on camera, walking through the room to get as close as I, as, as necessary to be able to photograph the speeches. Cause generally dad's speech lasts three sentences. So you've got to be in there. And as I'm walking through the the centre of a couple of tables at the back of the room to get through to get to the point where I want to be for photographing the speeches, I'm taking the lens cap off of my of my lens or off my camera because I've only just put it on the camera. But as I'm in the process of taking the lens cap off, a drunk cousin <laughs> <laughs> who weighs a lot more than me and is. Uh, Uh, Did I mention drunk? (laughs) You did. Very drunk. Very drunk. Stands up, stands up and shouts over the dad's speech. It works better without the lens cap, you see. And I'm saying see as in the C word. He shouts, it works better with, it works better with the lens cap off, you see at me across the room. To which point 110 people turn around and look at me. And I have to mime that I've already taken the, the lens cap off and that there's no problem. <laughs> and I feel like I've interrupted the speeches. Okay. Yeah. Now, I was very timid about weddings at this point. I was still in that phase that you were in. But there was something that happened just after this. So the same wedding, I didn't do anything. We carried on just photographs of speeches and stuff. Yeah. Once the speeches are done and people have had their meal and they're milling about outside, one of the things this couple had was a piece of paper on the tables that said, and this piece of paper annoys me. <laughs> it's a lot of weddings and it annoys me. 
I understand it, but it annoys me. <laughs> it says, if the photographer misses any moments, uh. this is our hashtag on Instagram where you can put our photos and we can see them. Yeah. Now, I don't like the inference that I'm just there to miss moments, therefore you have to have a There's hashtag. There's actually a better way of using that. That's my opinion, but that's that's yeah. beside the point on this. So this piece of paper is on the tables. And this large gentleman who, by the way, is drunk. I'm not sure if I've brought that up enough yet. Was he drunk? He was smashed. Oh. He was shit-faced, as they say in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> He come marching over with this piece of paper like he had a warrant to serve and pushed it against my chest in front of three or four people that were stood nearby me, pushed it into my chest, which I'm very funny about physical contact like that anyway. And he said, see, look, Instagram, people can just take the pictures on their phone. It kind of makes you redundant. And quick as a flash. <laughs> and with this no, is true. And with no self-control, I said... You could buy the same shoes as Usain Bolt, but I don't think he's fucking worried. <laughs> At which point, all of the people around started laughing, and one of them, which was no way my doing, but made it ten times funnier now, but a lot less funny at the time, because I actually thought it was going to kick off, burst out laughing, and this one guy went, ha ha ha, you made a fat joke. And this guy's <laughs> face dropped, and I was like, oh, I'm going to get punched here. <laughs> so that was a defining moment for me. Now, I know it's really bizarre. No, I think it's hilarious. But I'll actually. explain why it's defining because I changed on that day. That was the, uh, there was other incidents over the course of that day with that guy, mm -hmm. but those two ones really stood out. And the reason that that stands out so much to me is because I changed and I became more boisterous and I spoke my mind a lot more at weddings. Yeah. And I challenged that kind of behavior earlier so that it didn't get to an escalatory phase later on in the day yeah so as much of an of a ins insignificant part of the day as it was it completely changed the way that i approached my personality's integration with the wedding yeah and i actually feel a lot more confident now when someone you know decides to try and make a fool of me to kind of smile politely and say something <laughs> back but not in an aggressive way but to kind of stand my ground a little bit and have a bit of back and forth banter With that smile. and that it's okay so now that you've graciously <laughs> asked me i've given you plenty of time to think there as well because i really I actually, went off. I, well i already had mine anyway but you so. don't have to say that okay <laughs> i just thought about it now i should just cut it off there and say that's the end of the podcast <laughs> So no, go on. What's yours? What's your defining moment as a wedding photographer? Mine, uh, completely different to yours, obviously. Um, but mine is we photographed a wedding in Derby two years ago. Yeah, I want to say two years ago. It was. Fo <laughs> you, you know automatically. Yeah. Um, and the day before we were in Nottingham, we went to Derby for this wedding and I was left in bride prep. Everybody was super lovely. And I took a photograph. Uh, grandma came in. Adorable, sweet, lovely, polite lady. Um, and she came in and she sat down. She had a fascinator in her hair. She looked absolutely beautiful. And the bride came over to say hi to grandma. And they had their moment where grandma is looking at the bride just so full of joy and happiness and just so much love. And I took three pictures, but there's, I think it might be the second of that trilogy of pictures that I always remember because it's the grandma looking directly at me and it's me sat, it's her telling me in my own mind that she's so happy about the day and she's just, this is just her special moment with her granddaughter. And for me, that's a defining moment because it's so important to get those interactions between people. So important because nobody's going to live forever and you have to get those moments. It's, it's my job. It's your job. It's every wedding photographer's job out there, whether you like it or not, to get those important moments. Because those are the moments that no one else sees. Those are the moments that no one else is going to, you know, freeze frame and say, do you want to take that photo again? Did you get it? Like they would do in a ceremony. That's just those moments. And those are pictures which the people in it and the people around it treasure for the rest of their lives. So now when I'm in bride prep and when 
when we're walking around and stuff, I'm now paying attention to those important people for the day that aren't part of the wedding party and aren't, you know, aren't necessarily um, the maid of honour or the or the best man, which people think are the most important. But it's the grandmas, it's the kids, it's it's all those things. It's who are the most important people and making sure that I then do my best to capture those moments again, because I just think that that's just lovely. Mine was funnier. <laughs> Yours was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Yours wasn't supposed to be funny. That's <laughs> no, brilliant. Thank you so much for doing this. And um, for the sake of posterity, um, something that I feel is only fair that I do, and I don't know if anyone's even still listening at this point, but if they are, I just want to say thank you so much for the last six years. You've, you've honestly, you've changed my life in the 15 years that we've been together anyway. But in the last six years, you've allowed me to work for myself to give other people something that I saw you were missing and you've put up with my temper and my ridiculous expectations <laughs> and my belief that everyone should be able to read my mind and you've been easily the best second shooter I could have ever hoped for you do all my emails and my taxes you are an underappreciated gem of a person and I want to make sure that everyone knows that and if anyone is listening uh, she is crying <laughs> I'm pulling my eyes out <laughs> but thank you so much for doing this as well thank you bye bye